last year's faith. Um, there may be things that become so real to you, God speaks to you, tells you something, you live on that. You can live on those things uh, because you know when God spoke something specifically to you, that's always for you. It never goes away. You know, when God tells you something, it is, it is eternal. It's a, it's a part of who you are, what he has for you. Uh, we have to see the word is like that as well. Once you get a revelation of what God said about you uh, in his word and, you, and you, you realize, man, this is personally for me, it'll change your life forever. Amen? So praise the Lord. Well, um, where are we going to start this morning? I think we'll look at Matthew chapter 8. Turn your Bible over to Matthew chapter 8. Uh, I began last week. We're going to teach several weeks. Um, we're going to talk about faith. We're calling this series 24-7 Faith. That means every day, faith in the morning, faith in the noontime, faith when the sun goes down, you have to live by faith. God says, my righteous ones. It's quoted three times in the New Testament from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. My righteous one shall live by faith. Faith pleases God. So we talked all last week, gave you a good introduction uh, about faith, some very important details. Without faith, you can't please God. Uh, let me say this. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth made this statement concerning faith. He said, any man can be changed by faith no matter how he may be fettered. I know that God's word is sufficient. One word from him can change a nation. Hallelujah. One word from him can change any situation, can totally turn you around, give your life new direction. Praise the Lord. Just hearing the wonderful word of God. So that's really going to be part of the emphasis we're going to talk about this morning concerning faith. And um, so this would be really fact number one. If we were going to give you some different, very important things about faith, or th what I would say, like if I was uh, like I'm, I'm writing this book, so if I'm writing the book, this is going to be number one. Uh, faith begins where the will of God is known. So that's where we're going to go this morning. So faith begins, if you want to know something about faith or what I, biggest things that when I think about faith, if I was going to give you, man, these are the important things you need to know about faith. Number one, faith begins where the will of God is known. Now, one of the examples that happened in my life way back in 1998 when Don and I first moved to uh, Canadian, Texas, I was a youth pastor. Uh, I was actually a part-time youth pastor in First Methodist Church in Snyder, Texas. We would drive down every weekend, and I would teach the youth in the morning, the youth class, and then we'd have church, stay, hang out all day, and then I would do uh, the junior high, senior high youth that night, and then we'd drive home. So it was a pretty full day for us. Um, but anyway, uh, that summer of 1998, a position opened up in Canadian, Texas. A pastor invited me, asked me to come, and, uh, and so we, took, we felt like it was the direction of the Lord. I've been praying about that, but anyway, while we were up there, one of the nights the pastor was uh, doing a Bible study, and some things that he was talking about really, really, uh, sometimes you, if you're sensitive to the Lord, sometimes there's, you, you, have to make, you have to pull aside and pray. There's times that you will only get things from God if you pray, if you, ha you have to pray. You have to pull aside, get quiet, and seek God. I'm down on my face. Donna and Bracken was just a newly born, wasn't that old, maybe a year old, and uh, and so uh, they had already gone to bed, so I was in my living room. I remember I'm in front of them. I had a little stereo, uh, little living room, and I'm right in front of the stereo, and I can, I can remember the light is on in the hall. There's a hallway over this way and a bedroom that way, and I remember the light. The only light I remember being on is in that hall, and I'm down on my knees, and I'm praying, and I'm talking to God about something that's stirring in my heart. And, uh, and he said something to me that has, uh, you know, at the time, you don't know, all, you don't know everything, um, but it becomes a basis for uh, the will of God for your life. Faith begins where the will of God is known. So there's things in the scriptures that God tells us about life, how to live it, what he expects of us, who we are. But you don't always know all the details about your life or maybe what he's called you to do. So you've got to know him. You've got to have a relationship with him. And we're going to talk about that probably next week um, because that's very important. Uh, so I'm letting the Lord lead us. But anyway, as I'm on my face, I'm praying, I'm talking to the Lord about something. Immediately he said to me, uh, he, he spoke something that was kind of a double phrase, and then he said to this, he said, I'm going to use you throughout the world. Now, um, that was, I'm a, I'm a, I wasn't, I'm, I'm probably 20, gosh, 27 uh, years old at the time, um, up in Canadian, Texas, up in the wilderness, you know, in Canadian, if you've ever been up that direction, rolling hills up in there, and uh, in a small church, and I'm thinking, you're going to use me? That, that's like saying, I'm going to go to the moon, be an astronaut for NASA, you know. It was so out there. Uh, but I wrote it down because I, I, I like to keep a journal. So if I'm praying, if God speaks, I'm going to write it down. And I felt like I, I felt that I heard him. 
and that he said, and I'm going to use you throughout the world. So I just wrote that down. I didn't have a clue what that meant or how that was. But now, years later, you know, that's, that's, that's a little while back, 1988, you know. And now uh, I, I've seen that come to fruition and still even bearing, uh, coming even more fuller, you know, because the plan of God is progressive to where I've been in 27 different nations now. Uh, preaching the word, sometimes two times a year, uh, fixing to go to New Zealand in September. I'll be heading back there, uh, Spain and Albania coming up. But anyway, but what help, what, how that strengthens and helped me is because uh, so much of that decision of where I go in life, I go back to that, that I know God said, I'm going to use you, and I've seen him uh, doing that. So he continues to do it, and I don't back off of it. Amen. So even when I didn't have the finances to go, I just said, Lord, I know this is the will of God. I know this is part of the call. This is what I'm supposed to do. And so he always provides because that's called walking by faith. Hallelujah. Because, you know, well, this is what God said. So I don't look at my circumstances to determine if I can do this. I mean, that's what God, in other words, you see something in the word. This is what I'm supposed to do. Well, you don't look at your circumstances to decide if I can do this. You just begin to step. And you begin to move. And that, and that also, in that process, you're actually trusting in what he said. You're leaning on what he said. You understand what I'm saying? And versus what you see or even how you feel or those circumstances. So you have to learn. To, that's called walking, living by faith. All right? And so we're going to talk this morning about faith being based on the revealed will of God. Because that is something that God revealed to me. And I, and I continue to base my life on it, on my ministry, what he's called me. And that's just a small portion. That's just one thing. I'll give you another example here a little bit later. But, you know, how many of you, and as I was thinking about this, how many of you when you were kids remember just trying to beg your parents for stuff? I mean, you might know what I'm talking about, begging? Like, please, I got to have it. You know, you're like, I mean, I remember, I remember when these, when, these uh, when I was in elementary school, these, uh, they call them, uh, what, well, I don't remember, a, a backstop thing where, where you could throw the baseball and it, would, and it would bounce off the net and come back to you, you know, and it had the little square so you could be a pitcher, you could work on your pitches, you know. I remember when I first saw that, I, meant, I, I had to have that, and I got it. There's something about kids and begging and like, you, you don't back off, you know what I'm saying? You just keep coming with it, and it's like, we better get this because we are tired of hearing this kid talk about this backstop thing, you know, and it lasted about a week, you know, anybody know what I'm talking about, you know? Uh, you know, and, and then it sits beside the house for the next two years till it finally just rots and you got to throw it away. Anyway, but, but, but think about why, why do kids beg their parents? Here's the reason why. Because you're not sure if they'll do it. And if we, man, if we really just beg and beg and beg, and what happens is we carry that over and we think that's the way God operates. That if we just beg him enough and plead, oh, God, please, I need healing or I need some money. And, and if we just beg him, but listen, faith doesn't beg. You understand? You can't, you can't operate like that. Faith is always, faith has a knowing about it that it's totally different to where it's like you know something belongs to you. Or let's, let's say, for example, your parents said, hey, you know, I saw something. Would you like to have that? You go, yeah. You walk into the store and you say, hey, uh, we going to pick this up today because you said it's mine. I could have it. It has a confidence about it. It has a knowing to it. And so it's like when the Bible says in Psalm 23, it, yo, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't beg. He didn't say, I don't beg. He said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I, I fear. I know we don't fear. We don't beg. No, we know that God is with us. His rod and his staff. They, so you understand, that's the way faith operates. And it's important to understand that because faith is based on the revealed will of God. And God tells you something. He shows you. Uh, another example, uh, a, a good one is if I walked in here this morning, now this is purely suppositional. If I just had a big old fat wad of $100 bills and I walked in now, now my, the example being my word would be like God's word as an example. But if I walked in here and I said, man, I got a big old wad of $100 bills and I'm going to give somebody in here $100 this morning. How many of you could have faith to say, man, pastor, I'm, one of, I'm, I'm the one. You, you, I'm going to take the $100. How many think you could get the $100? How many have faith for $100? Well, see, it's always mixed because, you know, so, well, maybe you have $100. Man, I got a bill that just came in. Woo, that $100, man, I, 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 that's mine. I'm, I'm, man, I'm, I need it. Just, well, just because you need something doesn't mean you qualify for faith. God's not moved by needs. 
All right? So, but if I said, I'm going to give somebody in here $100, let me just put it like this. You cannot, it is impossible for you to have faith that I'm going to give it to you. It's impossible. Why? Because you're just hoping that I'm going to give it to you. There's nothing solid. There's nothing firm that tells you I'm going to, you're going to be the one out of, uh, you know, out of 150 people to get $100. You understand? So you really, that, that is, all you can do is just kind of hope, kind of like winning the, you know, a lottery or something. You know, pulling the lever. You just hope something's going to happen. And God, faith doesn't operate like that. You understand? But now here's the difference. What if I came in here and I said, man, I'm blessed today. I got a wad of $100 bills. I'm going to give five people in here. Are you here? I'm going to give, or let's just, let me check like this. I'm going to give whosoever, I'm so blessed. I'm going to give whosoever is in the building within the sound of my voice, I'm going to give you $100. Now, how many of you can have faith? I'm one of the ones that's going to get the $100. How? How can you get the $100? Because I said whosoever. So if I said whosoever, that, you, could, you could just come up and say right now, kid, come say, I'll, I'm whosoever, I'll take mine right now. I'll take it right now because well, I said, well, who said you're going to get $100? You did. You said whosoever, you're going to give $100. So I'm whosoever. I'll take mine now. Thank you. You know, that's the way some people operate. Some people go ahead and just possess it now. Some people are kind of thinking about it. Now, am I whosoever? Is that for me? Is that God? Well, listen, if God said it, it's yours. Amen. We're singing that song. I rest in your promises. So again, that's when you understand faith is a substance and, without, and, and, and faith is based on the revealed will of God. So, again, my word being like God's word, if I said, if I named you, or if I said whosoever, you can qualify to get the $100. But if I just said, I'm going to give somebody, that totally just kind of left things wide open, and you can't have faith for that. And people try to exercise, well, I'm, we're just believing. Well, what are you standing on? That's another way to talk about it. What do you stand? How, what, what, what gives you faith that you can have whatever, whatever it is you're believing for? Well, you've got scripture. You've got promises. Are you following me? So, again, God's word is his will. Now, that's very important to understand. We're talking about faith begins where the will of God is known. You need to know God's word is his will. Salvation is God's will. Did you know that? Sometimes people think, well, you know, maybe it's not God's will if I get saved, or maybe it's so and so. No, God, God's will is that everybody be saved. Everything that goes with salvation is God's will. Healing is God's will. Provision is God's will. Protection is God's will. And what we have to understand is the world is in darkness and doesn't know God's will, meaning his word. And they're like the leper in Matthew chapter 8. Did you find Matthew chapter 8? A lot of the world... Even Christians can be like the leper in Matthew chapter 8 who comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, if you're willing, you could make me whole. Look what he says in verse 2. A leper comes to him and bows down before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus stretches out his hand and touches him saying, I am willing. Everybody say, I am willing. You know, Jesus never told anybody no. No, he never told anybody no. He never told anybody, well, it's not a good day today. I'm just out of power. He never said that. He said, I'm willing. Be whole. And he touched him. And immediately the leprosy was cleansed. God hasn't changed. Jesus is a demonstration of the will of God, who God is. He's a representation. He told his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So God wants people to know his will. Faith is based on the revealed Will of God. So not just the will, but it's got to become a revelation to you. It's got to be light to you. Like the psalmist said, remember Psalm 119, I think it's what, 135? Your word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. All right? So it becomes a light. It becomes a revelation. And God wants people to know his will. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises or his promise. As some count sluts. Now, he's referring to the coming of the Lord. I mean, we're supposed to, use, we are, like I mentioned last week, our faith is eternal. We are to be believing for things that, that are uh, prophesied and are to come to pass, like the return of the Lord. We are supposed to be looking for his coming, looking, expecting his return, living as if he's coming any day. That's, that's called demonstrating your faith, using your faith. So he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. Notice, not willing that any should perish. Notice, willing. Again, God is not willing 
that any should perish. Sometimes people say, well, we don't, people always talk about when the Lord's coming. Well, well, I thought he was coming. How come he hasn't come? You should just say right there because he's not willing that any should perish. And so he's given, I mean, he's merciful and he wants as many people as possible to be saved before the end takes place. Before, you know, again, all the, 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 uh, the ages change, begin to change. I mean, nothing's ever going to come to an end. You understand that? I mean, the ages are going to change and different things, but but he's not willing that any should perish. Notice that, but that all should come to repentance. God wants people to come to a place where they say, Lord, you are Lord. I yield to you. I call you my Lord. And that's really what salvation is. It's just saying, uh, because you can't be, it's not about being perfect. It's not about having to be perfect enough or good enough to come to the Lord. You just come to a place, you say, Lord, I repent. I'm ready to follow you. I'm ready to go your way. I'm ready to choose your, your plan, your path. And so God loves the world, and because he loves the world, he doesn't want anybody perishing. He sent his son to accomplish redemption, which was the will of God. Redemption is the will of God, was the will of God, is the will of God. And that's why Jesus said, I didn't come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me in John chapter 6. Is that right? Verse 38. He said, I didn't come to do, think about that. Jesus said, I didn't come to do my own will. I came to do the will of him who, him who sent me. And he mentioned that over and over so. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. So it ha- the will of God has to be something that we pursue. You only qualify for the goal that you pursue. Let me understand that. The moment you stop pursuing, things just start slowing down. You've got to pursue him. God wants you to pursue him. You understand? And so God's will, think about this, is a manifestation of who he is. God's will. That means he's love, so he's going to manifest love. He's life, he gives life. He's goodness, so he can't be anything but good. Amen? He's peace, so when you get around him, he's going to be peace. That's going to manifest. It is the will of God. He wants you living in peace. Matter of fact, he says, be in peace. Let your heart not be troubled, but be at peace. My peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. He's joy. Come on, God is joy. He sits in the heavens and laughs. Heaven's a place of joy. Man, when his presence comes, there's joy. He wants your joy full. That's the will of God. He's generous. He's generosity. So God, God's will is a manifestation of who he is. And so what's important about that is our perception of him has a major impact on what and how we receive from him. So your perception becomes knowing the will of God, understanding who God is, again, helps in knowing what you can expect from him. And what his will is. So where do we discover God's will? It comes from his word. Real plain and simple. Where do we discover God's will? From his word. Everybody say the word. So you can't separate God's word from him. You can't separate God's word from his will. That's why somebody says, well, Lord, you know, Lord, I believe, Pastor, Pastor, I believe the Lord's telling me to do this. Well, if that doesn't line up with the will, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's not God leading you. You can't separate God's word from his will, all right? Now, remember this. In John 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning was what? The word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. Everybody say, the word was God. So, again, when you're talking about faith being based on the revealed will of God, you've got to come back to the word. What does the word say? Who is the word? God is the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Word became flesh, dwelt among us, verse 14 says, but now look at Revelation chapter 1, chapter 19, verse 13. This is referring to Jesus. It says, he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called what? The Word of God. His name. So again, if you want to find out who God is, he's the Word. And and we could go for months talking about the Word. You understand? I mean, Lord, I feel like I'm just kind of hitting the tip of the iceberg here. And I'm trying to talk about faith, but you have to, I'm a teacher, so I want to back up a little bit and say, look, this is where faith begins, where the will of God is known. How do we find out the will of God? From his word, what he said about himself, what he says about you. God's words, he tells us, are spirit and life. John 6, 63, they're spirit, they're life, they're truth. John 8, 31 and 32, if you continue in my word, he said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. John 17, 17, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. You talk about a sacrifice. Jesus said, I sanctify myself that they might be sanctified. That's the important. Get, the best thing you can do for everybody around you, for your wife, for your husband, for your kids, get in the word. 
Sanctify yourself in the because the word cleanses you, it washes you. I mean, the word, woo! The psalmist said, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great spoil. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. His word is living and active, Hebrews 4.12 says, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide us under the division of soul and spirit, joint and and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of our heart. And then you talk about something crazy. It says, and the eyes of him are open. He doesn't, God, I mean, the word has eyes. Nothing is hidden from him, from whom his eyes. I mean, it's just, if you think, I mean, he's the word. (laughs) Amen. And so God's DNA, his life is in his word. His word is God-breathed. I mean, there's so many different directions we could go with this. The word carries the same authority as if the master stood in our bedroom, your living room, your kitchen, and spoke it to you. That's how authoritative the word of God is. Let me say it like this. God does nothing apart from his word. I'm going to say that again. God doesn't do anything apart from his word. That's why if you know what his word says... And remember, he said, put me in remembrance of my word. Remind me what I said. I mean, his word, God, you don't have to beg. All you got to do is say, Lord, this is what you said. And you have confidence. And it it becomes so personal to you. It's his word to us. So God doesn't do anything apart from his word. Psalm 138, verse 2 says, for you have magnified your word above all your name. And then in Psalm 119, verse 89, he says, forever, O Lord, your word Everybody say your word is settled in heaven. So the word, we're talking about faith begins where the will of God is known. How are we going to discover what the will is? Go to the word. Find out what God said or what is God saying to you. Even the angels respond to the word of God. Psalm 103 verse 20 says, bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his what? His word, obeying the voice of his word. Even angels respond. That's why when you speak the word, when you declare the word, I don't care if you're talking the word over your body, angels got to get involved with it. I mean, if you need some angelic help, start speaking the word financially, physically, whatever it is, relationally, just start speaking the word and say, thank you, minister and angels, go. You're causing the word to come to pass. They respond. They hearken to the voice of his word. The word of the Lord from Isaiah tells us God's word is like rain coming down to water the earth. Why are we talking about these? Faith begins. Faith begins where the will of God is known. And so God says, I've given you my word. He said in Psalm 107 verse 20, I sent my word and healed them. People need healing. God says, I'm going to send my word. Woo, all right. So Isaiah says it like this in Isaiah 55 verse 9. Look, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. Everybody say, his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it barren sprout and furnishing seed to the sower, bread to the eater. Watch this, verse 11. So will my word be. So will, God's given us a picture, just like the rain coming down and, and provides nourishment and so forth. My word, which goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I send. In other words, you find out what God says and that God says, he put, he, God speaks his word for a direction and when you get in alignment with it, it can't fail. It's going to produce, it's going to succeed in the direction that he sent it forth. So whatever you need in an area of your life, man, find out what God said about it. Uh, here's another example. God's word is like seed. 1 Peter 1.23 says, for you have been born again. You know, when you get born again, he says you're born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. It is through the living and enduring what? Word of God. It's the word of God. Faith begins where the will of God is known. How do we find out what his will is? You find out what he said. His word is his will. Hallelujah. Verse 25 says, but the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word which was preached to you. And then in chapter 2, verse 2, he says, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. So it is like seed. Amen. Hallelujah. How many know you could say it like this, without planting seed, you can never expect to harvest? You don't plant any seed, so your heart is like the place, it's the ground, I mean, we know Jesus in the parable of the sower. Jesus taught that the seed, which is the word going into the ground, good ground, will produce 30, 60, and 100-fold. 
What is it that produces 30, 60, 100 fold? It's the word. It's the seed of his word. His word getting, listen, his word getting on the inside of you. That's why the devil wants to keep you busy with watching Netflix, keep you busy reading this, looking at that, and so busy that you don't ever have time to hear God. You want to hear God? Open up the word. Pray. Get in his face. Lord, what you saying to me today? What, what do you want me to do for you? Direction in life, situations, circumstances. Find out what he's talking, what he's saying. Hallelujah. And we'll talk more about this, but we've got to understand here. This is important to you. You've got to understand, uh, God cannot lie. When it comes to his word, his word, it's, it's uh, fail-proof. He cannot lie. Numbers, chapter 23, verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said it, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Hebrews 6, 18 you should know this one. Hebrews 6.18 says, it is impossible. Everybody say impossible. <laughs> Come on now. It's impossible for God to lie. That means if he said he would supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ, you should make sure you figure out how that works. Because his, his riches and glory don't run out. But there's some, in, but some things in there about how you get your faith working with that. That's another message. But you've got to understand something here. Our adversary, the devil, has always challenged God's word from the beginning. His goal has been to create doubt. Anything that God says, the enemy's going to come and he's going to attack it. He's going to try to, he's going to get you to doubt. He's going to, he wants you to, he'll try to mess with your perception concerning God. In other words, how you see God. See, a lot of the world sees God as this big, big, mean, ugly dude. He's out to get you. If you don't do something, God's going to get you. If you don't tithe, God's going to get you. If you don't, you know, if you don't, man, it's just that, you know, and if, and if you give your life away, it's going to be rough. It's going to, you know, it's going to be sorry and sad. And, no, no. You give your life away, it's going to be joy. It's going to be happiness, fulfillment, all right? But the enemy has always challenged God's word. He challenged even the very beginning concerning what God said about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember, he said, hath God said? So he's attacking what God said. Let me understand, God's words are powerful. In the beginning, he spoke. So word... The word of God, you have to see, becomes, again, it's fail-proof. It's solid. It's foundational. It's truth. It's light. And so think about this. When the devil came to tempt Jesus in the wilderness, he basically attacked God's word in the process. I mean, in the very beginning, he said, uh, if you're the... And think about it. Right before Jesus goes in the wilderness, Jesus is baptized in the River Jordan. Holy Spirit descends like a dove. Heaven's open up and God speaks out of heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Everybody, you know, people heard it. Well, so what does the devil come right in there? If you're the son of God. In other words, he's attacking what God said. If you're the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Well, we know in that process, uh, anytime the enemy would attack the word, Jesus would always use the word as a rebuttal. In other words, flip it around. He always, Jesus, the word, used the word. Are you here? He would use the word. So in Matthew chapter 4, command these stones to become bread. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, for it is written. He always says, it is written. It is written. Jesus based his life, his ministry, everything that he was doing on, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, what? Word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So it becomes very important to understand that's where faith begins. When you find out what God said. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the Bible is a book of promises. Here's another way to put it. We call it the word, but it's actually, a, you know, it's actually a book of promises. I like singing what we're song. I will rest in your promises, my confidence. Why? Because we're talking about the promises. Actually, the Bible is one big promise. The promise of his love, the promise of his faithfulness, the promise of his benefits. It's just all his promises. And they're wonderful. I mean, you think about it. God's word is about him and his plan for man. God's plan for man for what? For eternity. His promises are magnificent. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God, Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Verse 4, for by these, notice, he has granted to us what? His precious, by thee, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent. Everybody say magnificent. 
magnificent promises, for by these you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. So it's the promises that cause you to escape. In other words, you need to know what God has promised you. What are his promises? Hallelujah. They're wonderful. And it's impossible for God's word to fail. Hallelujah. You know, it's impossible for his word. I love 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56. It says, blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promises, which he promised through Moses, his servant. Not one word. Everybody say not one word. You know, we're not going to be able to, we will not be able to stand in heaven and go and go not, uh, well, Lord, one of your words failed. No, it's impossible. We're going to find out not one word of all his prophecies, everything that he's declared, everything that he said, not one word will have failed. Not one. It's that powerful. He is the word. It's impossible for him to fail. And so I like, we know 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For as many, as many as are the promises of God in him, in other words, in Christ, in Jesus, they are what? <laughs> Come on, somebody. They are what? He didn't say, well, no, uh, sometimes, sometimes God says yes, sometimes God says no. <laughs> That is not in the Bible. That is somebody's religious mumbo jumbo. Well, sometimes he says yes, and sometimes he says no. No, if you know, if you know yes, yes means yes. If it's his will, it's yes. If it's not his will, it's no. But if it's in the word, it's yes. And Jesus is the fulfillment. Notice, therefore, also through him, through Jesus, is our amen. Let me just put it like this. Jesus is our amen. So we say amen. Jesus is the amen. We say amen to the glory of God through us. So, G so you just got to say, Jesus, you're my amen. Amen. That means so be it. Amen means so be it. Everybody say, so be it. That's what Mary, when the angel came, she says, so be it. So Jesus is the Amen. Amen. The fulfillment of God's promise. What God promised to man, Jesus is the fulfillment of it. Woo! And you're in him, and he's in you. So that means God's word is to be our faith food. Everybody say faith food. Now, how many are going to eat some lunch today? Yeah. Amen. My wife says she's ready. Yeah. Well, I mean... Most people are going to eat three hot meals a day, depending on what you have, maybe five or six, I don't know. But a lot of people, what happens is, compared to the spiritual life, they feed their spirit man one cold Twinkie a week. And you can't live like that, all right? The word is to be our faith food, living daily, like Joshua, look at it, abide by it, meditate on it. And so all of the Bible, listen, it's not about the subject of faith, but it has the capacity to produce faith in whatever area that you need it. So the Word of God, you could say it like this, is the factory for faith. Faith begins where the will of God is known. So the Word is the factory for faith. That's why 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, this is the confidence. Everybody say confidence. If you know another side word for faith, it's confidence. This is the confidence that we have. If we ask anything according to his what? His will. What happens? We know he hears us. In other words, well, sometimes the Lord says yes, sometimes the Lord says no. Right there, if we ask according to his will, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, well, I got goosebumps this morning while I was praying, so I know God. No, it has nothing to do with goosebumps. Go goosebumps. Daffy Duck going here. No, if we know that he hears us, we know we have the request that we've asked. We have the if we know God hears us, we know we have the request that we've asked. If we know that he hears us, what do we have? The answer. The request means we have the answer. We have the request. That's why he said, Jesus said, Mark eleven twenty four 24, for all things that you pray and ask, believe you receive it and you'll have it. Well, if you ask in faith and you know what you're praying in line with the will of God, you can say, "Woo! how would you act if you had it? If you believe you, he didn't say you saw it, you have it, you believe you have it, then it's happening, it's coming, all right? So we have the request that we've asked. So our beginning with God began with faith. It begins with faith. It's a spiritual substance that's made available when we hear the word of truth. We hear it. Everybody say, we hear it. The Bible's called the word of truth. Another 2 Timothy 2.15 is called the word of truth. The word of truth. Of truth. Now, go to Romans chapter 10. I want you to see this because the Apostle Paul 
is quoting. Now, this is really in connection with salvation, but it's how faith works. And, it, and you see, again, how faith comes. And that's what he's trying to help us to understand. And so he, he quotes something very powerful from Isaiah 53. In Romans chapter 1, 10, verse 16, the apostle Paul, quoting from Isaiah 53, he asks a question in verse 16, Lord, who has believed our report? Everybody say believe. To believe is the action. Faith is a noun. Believe is, is a verb. Believe means action. So he says, Lord, who has acted upon, who has believed our report or our message? So Isaiah actually declared in, in Isaiah 53, 1, he says the arm of the Lord, the power of God is manifested to those who believe. So that means the opposite of that would be nothing happening, nothing's happening if we don't believe, if we're not acting upon the word. Faith is acting like the word is true. All right? So he, Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Well, the arm of the Lord is revealed to those who believe. The, or you could flip it around and say the arm of God, the power of God is manifested to those who believe the report. So that report is the good news. So you can believe the good news or you can believe the bad news. So that report is the good news. It's the good news of redemption, what God has done for us in Christ. That whole chapter is what God did for us in Christ, him taking our place. And then Paul follows that question with the answer of how belief is established and how faith comes. In verse 17, look at it. Faith comes then by hearing, hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. In other words, it can be a quickening word. It just, Christ means the anointing, the anointed one. So it's a word that's, that's lit up to you. It's illuminated. See, faith has an illumination to it. If you go to Hebrews chapter 10, right before Paul goes into Hebrews chapter 11, he's talking to the Hebrews, and he says, at one point he said, when you, after you were illuminated, and you took the spoiling of your goods like a champ, you know, because you have an enduring faith. He says, don't cast away, your, we're going to look at that later. He says, you're casting, don't cast away your confidence that has a great recompense of worth. That means no matter what's going on in life right now, just hold steady with your faith, because in the long run, you're going to be so glad you stayed with God. Woo! When all the world may be shaken up and running loose and going, well, ah, you know, running crazy, you're going to be so glad that you stayed with God and you stayed steady. Hallelujah. And you'll be one of these days, you'll be known as one of the children of the Most High. Man, this life is so short. So what I want you to see here, he says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. That means God's word was written to reveal to us what he has done, what he desires and wills to do for us as his children. And we are to take that word and proclaim it. We're to take the word, not just proclaim it as a minister, as ministers of reconciliation, but we declare it in our life. You take the word and you declare it. You proclaim it over your life. You decree it. Job said, you'll decree a thing and it'll be established. So that's what Paul meant when he said in Romans 1.16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. Hallelujah to those who believe, to the Jew first and also for the Greek. Notice verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. See, there's a revelation from faith to faith. That is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. And we're going to talk about that living part coming up. But let me give you one more example in closing this morning. I was a, a well, I just told you already. Amen. No, actually, I didn't. I was, I'm in the same place. Now, actually, I was 30 miles south. I got confused on my stories here just a minute. Uh, that was Canadian. Uh, a few months after that, uh, we, uh, we got the, you know the story won't go into all of it, but we got the left foot of fellowship out of that Methodist church and didn't know where we were going to go. We ended up in uh, Wheeler, Texas, which is about 30 miles south of Canadian, Texas, and we got involved. We, uh, I became a youth pastor, did some worship on Wednesday nights. We had a Christian school, an FM, uh, a 24-hour FM radio station, and so I, I, we were involved in that church before God took us to Ramah. But what I was... Uh, but, but the word, what I want you to get, uh, what happened was uh, that summer, right before we were going to go to Ramah, uh, the pastor, we were going to have a joint service out on a ranch uh, with an Assembly of God church that was up in Canadian, and then our church, we were in Wheeler, so we were going to meet out on a ranch, it was about halfway, and we are going to have a big service uh, with the combined churches out on that ranch. Well, my pastor, since we were going to be leaving, the pa my pastor asked me if I would like to preach the service. So I'm like, whoa, yeah, man, opportunity, you know, and so... I decided, man, I am going to, I, I want to, I want a now word. I'm going to seek God for a, a word in due season. Man, I'm, I'm, Lord, man, we just, we, we're going to have revival out on the ranch. Woo! 
Woo, man, I'm going to press in. So I decided, I, I, I went on a three-day fast. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast. I'm going to, man, I'm going to pray extra. And I'm going to, I, man, I'm going to get this word, and we're just going to have heaven, heaven on the ranch. <laughs> Amen. So I'm praying. Well, I would go over to our, we, our, our, we had offices in, in the square where the school and the radio station was, and then we had the church building was separate. And so I would go over to the church. Nobody's over there, so I would go get in the church on this three-day fast, and I would go during, and I would go pray, and I would get in the auditorium, and I'm praying back and forth. Well, during that time period, as I'm, you know, you don't just pray, but I'm looking in the scriptures, I'm searching the word, Lord, what would, you know, for a message, Lord, what would you want me to say? And I just happened to be uh, meditating on Joshua chapter 1. And so I'm reading Joshua, and so I'm kind of, you know, it's on my mind, so I'm talking to the Lord about it. We're three different times in Joshua chapter 1, the Lord says, be strong and of good courage. Remember that? He says, as I have been with Moses, he said, Moses is dead. I say Mo for sure, Mo's dead. It's time for you to rise up, lead the children of Israel. As I've been with Moses, he said, I'll be with you. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life and so forth. And he says, but here's, here's the key. You're going to have to be strong and of good courage. And then he talks about this book, the law, not the part out of your mouth, meditate on it day and night, be careful to do it according to all written in, then you make it very possible you have good success. So he said, be strong. And I said, he said, be strong. Everybody say, be strong and of good courage. Well, I meditate on that. I remember I'm walking probably uh, this side. I remember the, auto, the, the platforms up here, and we had these, we had these uh, altar benches right in front of us out here, so you could come, you know, come to the altar and really seek the Lord, you know, but anyway, so I'm walking, and as I got right about that time, I'm thinking about that being strong, and it was like, the only way I can explain it, it was like the Holy Spirit yelled at me. It was like a megaphone, that's for you! I mean, just, I'll never forget it. It was like yesterday, because when God speaks to you, it's like yesterday, and it? it's just always like now, it's like, bam. You know where you are when he said when he spoke to you. You know right where you are. You know what the time. You know what was going on. That's, that's how you know God's talking to you because you, it's like time freezes and you know everything about it and what's going on in every direction. He said, "That's for you." And I'm like, "Oh, you mean that's not my message for the ranch?" You know, but it was like that. In other words, be strong and of good courage. That, that was, in other words, it's like a revelation. You mean you mean the Bible's for me? You mean that's for me? But it was such a Revelation, man, God, God's trying to get that to us. He said, he, he said, I wrote that for you. I spoke it and wrote it so you could get it in you and speak it, declare it, live, live according to it. So let me tell you how that hurt. So that was about a month, month and a half later, Don and I, we head to Ramah, loaded like Beverly Hillbillies, man. We loaded up our trailer, man. We got stuff, and, and I got stories. You know, I got a U-Haul, and then my El Camino's in the back, and I had my, I had my, my grill in the back of the El Camino, and coal, the coals, you know, the, the black stuff from the coal, was just like we were leaving a trail. It was like something was on fire, man. It was just burning, you know, just blowing coals and stuff. Anyway, it's funny. Anyway, but, but we get to Rama, and, and it's a lean time. It's a difficult time. Man, you're stretching on every area, and you're believing God, and you don't have a job for three months, and you're, and you're trying to believe God and go to school, and, and you got new, and now, and Benjamin's on the way. Hey, you know, and so you got, so now your third child, I mean, we got three kids and broke. Living on broke, but now, but now, I mean, I mean, I, we 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 rented a house, and it was the most expensive house we'd ever lived in before. Well, you don't have a job, so you know, I had a choice of a four seventy five or a five twenty five. I said, might as well take the five twenty five. Can I have the porch wing from another house to go with this one? So you know, you're trying to get a job, and you're trying to believe God, and uh, oh, man, and 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 so, at every difficult challenge, which was like daily. I'd go to God, you know, and then I'd get a little extra time. I said, "Man, I got to, man, God, I need some help. I need some money, I, I, you know." And you're just, you're living on, go to Rama. We were in the will of God. You understand? When you're just obeying God and wherever He tells you to go, whatever He tells you to do, He will supply. Now it may not be to exactly how you would like at the moment, but that's not always God's destiny. That's not the final destination where He's taking you. You're just passing through. All right, and so so we're just and so I would go to God over and over, and I'm I, man, I'm like God, I need direction. How to? And I need some help right now. I need some grace right now. And every time I would go to God, you know what I would hear? Be strong and a good courage. I'm like Lord, can't you tell me something else? But you know what? But that would get me. I would go back to that moment. That's for you. God many times will give you those things like that. Such a strong revelation because it's going to carry you through where you need to go. And, and it still carries me. I'm still going, but you know, sometimes you just say, be strong and of good courage. Not time to quit. It's not time to lay down. 
So again, I said all that to say, faith is based on the revealed will of God. And so no matter what point you get in life, when you know what God says, he'll take you back. Or a word will come up that you have deposited on the inside of you. And that's what we call, the, the psalmist said, Lord, quicken me according to your word. So many times those things will just come up, and that's what you, and you, you, know, you ever said, Lord, I just need some help right now, and sometimes something, a scripture will come up on the inside. Well, pay attention to that. That's, that's the Spirit helping you and leading you. You follow me? And so that word becomes like an anchor in your heart, and it gives you courage to stand right in the middle when it looks like there ain't no light in any direction. Everybody say Courage. That's really, the word will give you courage. That's what, I'm convinced, that's what David had when he, when he faced Goliath. He had faith. He said, this is an uncircumcised Philistine. I'm going to take your head off. But I'm sure he's out there going, it took courage. It took courage because everybody else is backing down. Let me just close with this. God's commands, leave you with this. God's commands, God's promptings are enablings. God, his words let me say it like that. They are enablings. They, they, they give you what you need, no matter what it is. You stand on that. Mark chapter 5 tells the story of a woman who had a hemorrhage of blood for 12 years. Many of us know the story. A life-changing moment happened when she heard about Jesus. It says, after hearing about Jesus, decided, man, if I just press in and touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be healed. What happened? What was the life-changing moment? She heard. Something that she heard gave her the courage, gave her the faith to press in to a crowd of people, risking being stoned because she's got this issue of blood instead of crying out unclean. So she presses in, touches, and notice what Jesus says. Verse 27, after hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind and touched his cloak, for she said, if I just touch his garment, I'll get well. Immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Verse 34, notice the answer. Notice the result. Jesus said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Remember, we know the story. Jesus stopped and said, wait a minute. Pow, somebody touched me. He said, Lord, what do you mean somebody touched you? He said, power went out of me. I like the 20th century translation. That somebody made a demand on my ability. All these people are touching him. But he said, somebody made a demand on my ability. What was that? That was a touch of faith. She pressed in, touched him, because what, what started it, she heard after hearing about Jesus, who he was, what he would do. He's the Messiah. He's the master. And so he says, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Be healed of your affliction. So notice what she heard gave her faith to obtain God's will for her life. It was God's will. It was God's will all along. It wasn't God's will that she had the issue of blood for 12 years. Just like the woman that was bowed over for 13 years. Jesus said, Satan has bound this woman for 13 years. She, being a daughter of Abraham, ought to be loosed. And of course, he prayed for her and she was healed. But finally, the last illustration. I said God's commands, God's words are enablings. We know Matthew chapter 14. We were singing about it. The oceans. Come on up, Jensen. Walking on the water. We know the story. Jesus has fed a multitude. He sends the disciples out. He says, I'm going to go pray for a little while. Sends them across out on the boat. He comes walking on the water in the middle of the night. I mean, get the picture. Here he comes. And the disciples go, ah, it's a ghost. Jesus says, no, it's me. Peter, what does Peter do? He says, Lord, if it's you, we're going to find out. If it's you, I need an enabling. God's words are enablers. His words, his commands are enablers. He says, if it's you, tell me to come. Well, it's like the centurion. Lord, all you got to do is say the word, and I know my servant will be healed. Because you're the word, and I understand how authority works. You know, all you got to do. So he said, if it's you, tell me to come. And he says, come. And you know the story. Peter steps out of the boat, and he starts what? He's walking on water. What's he walking on? Really, he's not walking on the water, really. He's walking on the command. Jesus commands. God's words are enablers. They give you the supernatural ability to do what you couldn't do on your own. You following what I'm saying? He acted. He, got, he acted on that word. So here's the bottom line to that. We're talking about faith begins where the will of God is known. If you want to walk on the waters of the supernatural, you're going to have to learn to stand on the promises of God's word. You've got to take the word as this is God's word to me. Just
he spoke to me. That's for you. Well, I don't believe that he was just talking about Joshua chapter 1. He meant, hey, this whole thing is for you. When you get it on the inside of you and you begin to apply your life to that word, faith is based on the revealed will of God, and that will get you where you need to go. Did you learn something this morning? Hallelujah. I want to be a water walker, don't you? Hallelujah. Just, what do you mean? What, what, well, it doesn't mean just doing something to say we walked on the water, but what I mean is doing those things that we could never do on our own. Fulfilling the plan and the will of God will require your faith. Supernatural substance on the inside of you. Hallelujah. Causing you to live prosperous. Amen. Living blessed, living healthy, not living in fear when other people are afraid. You're not afraid. People are working on, well, what if we, man, they're saying there, we might, there may be 20 people losing their job around here. You just smile and say, well, you know what? If, it, if it's gone, God's got something better for me. <laughs> Come on, say God's got something better. Why? Because he already knew it before you even had the thought. He's already got your back. But you do have to trust him. You are going to have to find out, okay, Lord, what are you saying? I need an enabler. What? A word. Your word, your word. Now, it's a different. Now, sometimes we think your word, what? It becomes a lamp to my feet. It's a light from my path. Faith is not just, well, you know, you just got to trust faith and step out. On what? Sometimes we have these Christianese phrases that don't, that don't mean nothing. What do you mean step out? No, faith is not just stepping out on nothing. Faith is a confidence. It is a persuasion that, you know what, I might not know where I'm going like Abraham. He went out by faith. He obeyed God, went out not knowing. In other words, he didn't, he, he didn't know the end result, but he know, hey, this is what I'm, I'm just, I'm following. God will direct me. He will show me. Praise the Lord. Lord, we thank you for the word this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you for this wonderful word that we have. You sent your word and healed us. Thank you for healing available right now. I'll just lift your hands. If you need healing in this place right now, come on. We're just going to declare and receive that word right now. Thank you, Lord. You sent your word and healed us and delivered us. Now just take it personally right now for your life. Say, he healed me and he delivered me. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the life-giving word. That word is life. When God's, when it's, it, you just got to see it. When he, when God speaks it, there's just life there. It's, it's, he's in it. Hallelujah. It's called the word of faith. There's power in there. When it comes, when it comes out of your heart, there's power in there. Life and death in the power of your tongue. So speak strength to it. Hallelujah. Speak wholeness to it. Speak to your situations. Hallelujah. Speak blessings over those situations. Speak truth. Say the truth. Speak the truth. Hallelujah. And the devil will flee. Ha ha. Woo. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6. That is your weapon. That is your sword. Hallelujah. That is your strength. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, we thank you for the word today. Hallelujah. Faith begins where the will of God is known. And your word is your will. Whether we find it written or you're speaking it to us, you're directing us in uh, certain points or times in life, seasons in life. We thank you there's always a word in due season. Come on, say that out loud. There's always a word in due season. That's scripture. Hallelujah. Speaking a word in due season. There'll be a word for you. If you're in a season and you say, Lord, I need the word, there will be a word in due season. If you'll listen, if you'll press in, God will give you the word for your season. Ha ha. Praise the Lord. I've never really said it like that before. But there'll be a word in due season for you because he is the word and he'll speak to you. Hallelujah. He wants you to know. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, we receive that. Why don't you stand up? Let's thank him right now. Come on, just stand up. Let's bless the Lord one more time before we're done. Make sure that he's done this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. If, if anything else, it should stir in you a hunger for his word. Like I said, you only qualify for the gold that you, that you search after. And Proverbs says it like this. You got to seek after silver. Search as for hidden treasure. Seek after the wisdom that comes from the word of God. It had just be, you had to be hungry for it. Amen. Hungry for the word. 
the Job, Job said it like this, I, I, I desire his word more than my necessary food. Think about that. His, in other words, Job says, God's word becomes so important to me that I, I'll miss a meal if I need to. His word. <laughs> you can eat it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. All right. Father, we praise you. We thank you. Hallelujah for the word. Hallelujah. Jesus is the word. And we reverence the word. Come on, say, I reverence the word. Hallelujah. You got, there's, boy, that's a whole nother direction right there. It's important that you reverence, have reverence for the word. That means it becomes very valuable to you. Uh, and so you'll look at it. You'll meditate on it. it. It becomes one of the first things that you, that you look for, looking for the word, reverence in the word. He is the word. So you're reverencing him. You're esteeming his words and what he said. So we thank you for the revelation that comes from your word, Lord. And we love you. We thank you. Hallelujah. You sent your word and healed us. Hallelujah. And delivered us. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So let me put it like this. And last one that comes to me. James said it like this. Chapter, he said, receive with meekness, with humility, the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Receive. Everybody say receive. With humility, the word which is able to save your soul. That means there's a renewing that takes place in your soul, and it helps you, and you overcome in that area. Praise the Lord. So, Father, we thank you for it. Say, I'm a, I'm a receiver. I receive the word. Thank you, Lord, that your word is impregnated with your life. And I'll receive of that life. I partake of that life. Your word is life to me. It's health to all my flesh. And so we delight in your word as one who finds great spoil. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, Mr. Denise has a few announcements. Don't forget, uh, if you're in need of salvation or any type of direction in life, uh, see Brody, the guy with the short pants over here. He'll help you out. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we love you. I'm just giving him a hard time today. <laughs> All right. Well, Pastor said God's word is to be our faith food. So I want to remind you this week, don't forget to eat. Amen. All right. Also remind you, sign up for the baby dedication. And Young and Marrieds do meet tonight. But at 7 o'clock Wednesday night, we'll all be back here for another great word from God. Amen. So be back here Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful week.